Amen. God is good all the time. Han and I visited with uh, uh, one of our families yesterday who have children. And uh, when they broke out in the front yard, we were still in our car when they broke out in the front yard, one of the little girls had sprouted so much I didn't recognize her. That's what 14, 15 weeks will do. You know, you haven't seen somebody? They just grow up. They just sprout up around you, you know. But it is so good to have you with us today. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 15. I have what I believe is a very timely, I hope all my sermons are timely, but I feel like I have a very timely message for us today. You know, you probably have heard this, we are living in unprecedented times. How many of you have heard that statement? Probably too much, right? I've heard it way, way too much because it gets overused. But let me suggest to you this morning, we are living in times that we've never lived in before. At least in a time that I've never witnessed before. And although I'm a young man, I've been around for a few years. And if we're not real, real careful, what happens is we get to looking at the things that are going on around us. And it sprouts such great uncertainty. Even for a child of God, a follower of Jesus Christ, we look around things that are going on around us and we wonder, wow, what, what's going on? I have a message for you this morning, I believe from God. John chapter 15, starting with verse 18. It, it may be a difficult message to hear this morning, but hang, hang on and help me get to the end. John chapter 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, since I chose you out of the world, the world therefore hates you. Who's speaking here? Who's speaking? Jesus. Jesus is speaking here. Verse 20. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my words, they will keep your words. But all these things they will do for you for my name's sake. Because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have had sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not performed among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. Think about that for a minute. Without Jesus, everyone wallows in their own sinfulness without knowing it. But now that we have a standard to live by, somebody shout amen. Sin is evident. If I had not performed among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now have they seen and hated, hated both my father and me. But that the word which is written in their law might be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the counselor comes, somebody shout amen. There are very seldom times where I feel like I want to do a dance. Now is one of those times. No, no matter what might be happening around us, no one understand this. There is a counselor. And he has come. And he is with us. Somebody shout amen. He is here. Have we not sung about that this morning? Have we not declared that he is here with us? That his presence is with us? Can you feel him this morning? But when the counselor comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me, and you, will also, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I want to speak to you just in a moment. Or at least we should be. Or at least we should be. 
Father, again, I thank you for this day and for the reading of your word. I thank you for those that have come out this morning, Lord God, and for those that are watching by live stream. I am so thankful that as a church, Angle Lake Neighborhood Church, we are still one in worshiping you and praising you. And although all of us can't be here in, in, uh, physically, I know that there are many across the cities that are worshiping with us together. And again, I just give you thanks. In Jesus' most wonderful name, amen and amen. I have only known in America where religious and civil liberties were celebrated and protected. But in my humble opinion, those days are quickly coming to an end. It can be very concerning and even a little frightening to think that we might be persecuted for being a Christ follower, but it is happening saw a sign of a fellow that was downtown Seattle, this was a couple of weeks ago when the riots were really heavy, that had a sign up saying, let Jesus come again, we'll kill him again. This is the age that we live in. And because you call yourself a Christ follower, people are going to hate you as well. This is why it is now more important than ever before. Now listen to me very carefully. That we be the church that Jesus Christ has called us to be. Not only called us to be, but mandated that we be. We are blood bought. Somebody shout amen. We are redeemed and delivered. We are washed by the blood of the Lamb. I am indwelled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so should you be to stand in the gap and regardless of what might be going on around us, regardless of what persecution may come, we will still stand and be the body of Jesus Christ that He has anointed us to be. When Christ chooses to speak, and although it didn't happen this morning, at least, at least not in the present, we got it over the internet. When God chooses to speak to us through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, when He speaks to us through the spoken word, when he speaks to us through the written word of God, I often wonder, are we listening? Are we hearing? Did, did you know it's one thing to, to hear? It's another thing to understand. It's one thing to hear voices or to hear noise. It's another to completely understand what, that, what those voices are saying. Are we really hearing the voice of God? Are we really paying attention to what's going on around us? Are we listening to Him or are we just paying lip service to what's going on around us? And my hope and my prayer for Angle Lake Neighborhood Church is that we will be a church that is attentive, listening, actively listening to what God is saying. And not just saying, oh, there goes another tongues and interpretation. It should never be just another tongue and interpretation. Somebody shout Amen. Man, I am so glad that God the Holy Spirit chooses to speak to us. Think about it for a moment. The same way He did to the people in the book of Acts. Can you get excited? To know that God still speaks and chooses to use you and I to speak through. And I hope and pray that we are listening. When the Old Testament prophets of old spoke... And if you don't believe this, pull out your Bible and just begin to read through the Old Testament prophets. But when the Old Testament prophets spoke, their warnings were mostly rejected by the people. Mostly rejected. The people did not want to hear what the prophets of old had to say. We called Jeremiah the weeping prophet. And he wept because no one would listen. And he felt like he was by himself. He begged God, send another orator because I'm not getting through. Yet God said, keep speaking my word. Keep declaring the truth. We need to be a people that will hear his words and not pay lip service. The prophet's role was simple. Be obedient. Speak what God demanded to be spoken. And listen to this key. Whether or not the message was received was between God and you. God and and his people. But what is the prophet to do? Speak the word. Someone say it with me. Speak the word. As God commanded it. In a, demanded it be spoken. And then the world can choose. Whether or not to receive it or not. To believe it or not. 
Did you know that still applies today? God still speaks the truth. God the Holy Spirit still demands that His truth be spoken. Whether or not people receive it is completely up to them. Most of us think that because we have the greatest and the most important message in all of history, that the world will stand and applaud and cheer us on for being the people that will speak the truth of God. And it should be that way, but my friends, it is not. When you start speaking the very truth of God, when you start telling the world who Christ is and who God the Father is, most of the time they're going to hold a sign up that says, if Jesus comes back, we're going to kill him again. Unfortunately, even those who say they love Jesus Christ and call themselves Christians, most of the time don't like to hear the truth either. Jesus has been giving in this particular scripture that we've been reading this morning, Jesus has been giving his disciples instructions on how they're going to not only survive, somebody shout amen. Say it with me, I'm going to survive. That's not an 80's rock song. Say it with me, I'm going to survive. You're going to survive COVID-19. Somebody shout amen. One way or another. I'm going to survive the riots. Somebody shout amen. I'm going to survive all the chaos. I'm going to survive. Why? Because Jesus Christ is still King of kings and Lord of lords. Glory. Thank you, Alice. I've been waiting 15 weeks to hear. And I get it from Alice. Glory. Not only to survive, listen to me this morning, we are not only going to survive, how many of you know that in Jesus Christ, it's not just survival, but it is to exceed with greatness and power and glory. We're not just to get by, but we're to get by with abundance. More than enough. Somebody say more than enough. Jesus was leaving. He was going to send another helper. He has just told them how they must always stay connected to the vine. How they must be branches that will bear fruit. But Jesus tells them, now this is a key point, Jesus tells them though that their relationship with the world around them, those who have rejected Jesus and refused to believe in Him, must be different. Must be different. Because the disciples loved Jesus and, so, and were so like Him. The world would transfer its hatred of Jesus to them. When you stand today and say, I'm a Christ follower, you put a big target on your back. You put a big target on your back. Because I'm here to tell you, most of the world does not want to hear the good news. But you and I have been commanded and directed to share the good news with the world. Can I get an amen? So why does the world hate us? Simply, my friends, because Christians are different. Or at least we should be. Let's not be fooled here, my friends. The world is a system ran by an intelligent head. And that intelligent head is Satan. He has one specific goal. To get the world order to, le to, leave, to leave God out. Satan has deceived the world and unfortunately much of the church world that it can live independently of God. We cannot live independently of God. I am dependent on the Holy Spirit. So are you. Or, or so you should be. You cannot reconcile the war between the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. James 4.4, 4, listen to this very carefully. You adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that the friendship with the world is imminent be with God. Whoever therefore will be a friend of the world is what? Says the enemy of God. I'll, I'm sure I'll get a comment, but let me say it again anyway. We cannot be friends with that which hates God. The world says, disobey God. Forget God. Don't follow God. Leave God out. Forsake God. You cannot be friends. Christ followers cannot be friends with something like that. You say, but Pastor John, aren't we commanded to go out and reach the world for Jesus Christ? Absolutely. To declare the glory and the presence of God. To share Jesus Christ. To ask the Holy Spirit to touch hearts and lives. But He did not tell us that we are to join hips with those in the world. 
Because you see, you cannot mix together with that that is evil. But we are to be in the world, declaring the glory of God, and let the glory of God shine through each and every one of us so that the power of the Holy Spirit can convict the world and see the world changed. I don't know when the church got the ideal that the way that we will win the world is by being friends with the world. The world doesn't even like that. Non-believers don't even like that. You know what happens when you try to look like the world and talk like the world and be like the world? The world looks at you and says, hypocrite. It is time that the church stood up and stopped being a hypocrite. Can I get an amen? And understand and know that you cannot win the world by being friends with the world. I believe that, that listen to me carefully, this is a very important part. I believe that what will win more people to Jesus Christ is a blood-bought church. A church that's indwelled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, living in the world, but not being a part of the world. We have to be in the world, but by being in the world, I am separated for the glory of God. You see, I've been cleaned up. I know. Do I look like it? I've been cleaned up. God, the Holy Spirit took me and He cleaned me up. He washed me. He made me new. He put a joy in my heart and a spring in my step. And He said, go forth and declare that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can get to the Father except through me. And know at the same time, that message will fall most of the time on deaf ears. Jesus said the road to heaven was what? Narrow. And the road to destruction was what? Broad. Jesus himself said that. What Jesus was saying was there's not going to be many people that make heaven. Think about that for a minute. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. But Jesus also knows that he wants as many people to be in heaven as possible. That's his heart's desire. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. Did you know God doesn't want anyone to go to hell? He wants everyone to go to heaven. Somebody shout amen. He's given each and every one of us a rescuer. He's given each and every one of us the ability and the power to reach out to God and receive Him as Savior. To gain heaven and to shun hell. And yet most of the world will what? Shun Jesus. And grasp hold of darkness. The more you look like Christ, the more you look like Christ, the more the world is going to treat you the same way it treated Jesus. When you don't act, talk, or think like the world does, you're going to make the crowd uncomfortable. Nowadays, you're going to make the crowd violent when you don't look and say and be what they say you should look and say and be. You're not going to be one of us. The fact is, my friends, if you call upon the name of Jesus, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will not look like the world. Very simple. Very simple. 1 Peter 2.9 But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. So that you may declare the goodness of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. In times past you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. If you've been called out of darkness and you now walk in his marvelous light, would you give the Lord a clap off for your praise in this house this morning? Give the Lord a clap off for your praise. We now need to walk in this light. Not drift back towards darkness, but stay in the center of God's light. Because in that light, He will hold us and keep us. How many of you are so thankful for mercy this morning? I am so very thankful for mercy this morning. Let's not disgrace God. Let's not disgrace God by not applying His mercy, not only to my heart, but to the hearts of those around us. Another reason that the world hates you is this. Because of followers of Christ, 
We must insist on an absolute standard or absolute truth. Or at least we should be. Or at least we should be. If the church today is not undergoing persecution, it may be because there is very little distinction between the world and the church. You go look for yourself. Go look up Barna. Go look up any of these uh, uh, McKenna. Go look up any of these... uh, uh, go look at Pew Research. Go look at these statistics that they're running around out there. Most of them say that the, they consistently show that there are no noticeable differences between the lifestyles of those who attend church and those who do not. That just goes to show you that attending church won't save you. Now, don't, don't misunderstand. I want you to be here. Somebody shout amen. I want you to attend But more than wanting you to attend, I want you to have a transformation in your heart. I want you to know Jesus. Somebody shout glory. I want you to know Jesus and all of his power and all of his working hand in your life. I want you to see him for who he is. Very little, very little difference between the lifestyles of those who attend church and those who do not. The church of Jesus Christ cannot allow itself to fall into the trap of allowing the secular culture. Listen to me. We cannot allow the secular culture to to invade our minds and our hearts, both in the pew and in the pulpit. Maybe a godless society sees nothing about the church worth persecuting. That in itself may be the most telling criticism the church faces today. They hated Jesus because they did not know the Father. They will hate you Because they do not know Jesus. They heard what he said. And they saw his lifestyle. And it revealed their sinfulness. Now there is an absolute standard. Everything must be measured against Jesus. You see when we live a life that imitates Christ. It brings to mind our own sin. And we can quickly run to God and ask for forgiveness. Can somebody shout amen? Anyone here ever been convicted by the Holy Spirit? How come every hand did not raise up in this place? Anyone ever been convicted by the Holy Spirit? Every hand should be raised. Because, I don't know about you, but I have, a, I have times in my life when I fall backwards. I must be the only one. I'm so sorry. Please, please forgive me. Not only does it reveal sin in our life, did you know that your presence reveals sin in other people's lives? Why? Because the Holy Spirit lives in you. Now, I don't know if it happens to you. Maybe just because I'm a pastor, it happens to me. But I can walk into a room and where people are not saved, and they know that I'm a pastor, and immediately the atmosphere changes. In fact, a few people will get up and leave. Because they know what? They're convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit that has just come in the room. Not Pastor John. They're convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody shout amen. Amen. But you see, I represent Christ. I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And when I walk into a place, I should hold my head up and present Jesus Christ to the world that desperately needs Him. And when that happens, those that are full of sinfulness... You see, before Christ shows up, they don't understand their sinfulness. But when Jesus shows up, there's a standard to live by. And by goodness, they will see then that their life is sinfulness. And they need to repent and get right. We need to be that in the world around us. So that the world can see Christ for who He is. And let their sins become evident to them. I told my dad, it was Father's Day last Sunday. My dad hasn't been with us now for several years. But I told my dad one time about a book I read by Ravi Zacharias called Deliver Us From Evil. And in this book, great book by the way, if you ever get a chance to read a great book. But in this book he talked about how you can put a pot of water on a stove and put a frog in it, okay, the water. And he'll just swim around. You can turn the stove on and he'll swim around. Until he boils himself to death. And he will never know that the water killed him. Why? Because he had acclimated himself as the water got warmer. But if you took that same frog and dropped him in the pot. He'd jump straight out. 
the hot water. He jumped straight out because the water was hot. You, you see, we've lost the ability to, to discern what's going on around us. And I, and I told my dad, I said, you know, in the book of James, it talks about as we look in this, in this book, it's a reflection. It should be a reflection of my sinfulness, that that I, that I come up short in. And, and I told my dad, I said, it's so easy. I, I can see that because when I look in a mirror, it shows the reality of Pastor John. Now listen, when, boy, I want to come down front so bad. I feel confined here a little bit. When I'm not looking in a mirror, I have all my hair back. There's no fat. No wrinkles. I'm a stud muffin. But when I get in front of the mirror, guess what happens? Reality shows up. We better get to a place where we can discern what the wonderful Word of God says about each and every one of us. And listen to this. Without Christ, I am doomed. Without Christ, I have no hope. Without God, things are hopeless. But with Jesus, I have everything I need to get by and abundantly more. Can somebody shout amen? amen. How many of you know that today? That in the Word of God, I find everything I need. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I may not look good when I look in the mirror. But I know that when I look in God's Word, He's given me everything I need to be that person that He wants me to be. He is my absolute standard. Can somebody shout amen? And everything must be measured against Christ. When you live a life that imitates Christ, you will bring conviction to the world. I want to reflect holiness. Anybody else with me? I want to reflect holiness. I want the world to be uncomfortable when I show up. I want the world to be convicted when I show up. Because my friends, that is the call that God has laid on each and every one of our hearts. You say, Pastor, I don't want to be hated. I don't either. But I want Jesus Christ to be lifted up. Because His Word said, If I am lifted up, I will draw all men and women to me. Say, Pastor, it's not fun being persecuted. You bet it's not fun. But I tell you this, on that golden day, when I walk into the, glory, into the gates of glory, Jesus has said, I will take you by the hand and I will introduce you to, to God and I will say, here is John, my faithful servant. Anybody else? Anybody else? You say, life is hard. Yes, it is hard. But I have the hope of the Holy Spirit that is within me. Can somebody shout amen? No, the world doesn't want to be confronted by a higher standard. That is why they are so quick to latch on. Listen to me very carefully. That is why they are so quick to latch on to anything negative about you and the church at large. Oh, they'll find every flaw you have. They'll find every flaw the church has. And they love to point it out, don't they? They love to point out all the failures, your failures. It, you, are you one that says, I don't have any? Anybody here have any failures? They love to point them out, don't they? But every time, listen, every time the devil reminds you of your past, would you remind him of his future? Remind him of his future. Another reason why the world hates us is because we remind them of the God they hate. Or at least we should be. They hated Jesus so much that they did what to him? Crucified. Say it loudly. Crucified. They crucified him. What was his crime? Was his crime turning the water into wine? Was it because he caused the blind to see, the deaf to hear, or the crippled to walk? Was it because he talked to the weather and it obeyed? Was it because he cast demons out of people? Was it because he raised the dead? Was it because he could walk on water? Was it because he fed the 5,000 with a few sardines and a couple of pieces of flatbread? No. No. 
No, 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 these were not his crimes. They killed him because he dared to claim that he was the son of God. In fact, not only did he claim to be the son of God, he claimed to be God himself. How many of you can shout, Amen? Amen. And amen. Harry Ironside tells the story of a missionary that was in Africa in a very isolated village. And one day the missionary left a mirror hanging in a tree after shaving. The wife of the tribal chief came along and looked into it. She had never seen a mirror before and she asked, Who is that ugly woman? Well, the missionary explained her the mirror and what it did. And then he simply told her, You're that ugly woman. I'm not sure I would have said that to her. He told her that she was the ugly woman. What do you think she did? She took the mirror and threw it to the ground, breaking it into a hundred pieces. Why? Because the world doesn't like to see itself as it really is. I am so thankful I know who I am. How many of you are thankful you know who you are? If you're thankful for who you are, give the Lord a clap offering of praise in the house today. The world doesn't want to be shown what it looks like. It makes them mad. They can't take out their hatred on Christ, so they will take it out on you. Now listen, maybe the most important part of this sermon, another reason the world will hate us is because we have the Holy Spirit to help us share the gospel. Or at least we should be. Or at least we should be. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have been given the ability to tell the world how wonderful our Lord is. What He has accomplished in our lives and to show the world just how real He is. I feel like I've t told my... I, we've been here 12 years. Little, actually, in December, it'll be 13 years. I feel like I've told all my stories at least once. And a few of you probably go, Pastor, I've heard them a lot more than just once. But as I told uh, Mark Miller, who used to be the youth pastor here, Mark came to me one time and he goes, I don't have your stories in my sermons. I said, you haven't lived long enough. When you've lived long enough, you'll have a few stories. Somebody shout amen. But my friends, I remember very clearly, listen to me very clearly, spending 22 years on active duty in the United States Army. And through a large part of that, I was a believer in Jesus Christ. A large part of that time, I tried my best to walk a life of holiness. To be the example that Christ called me to be. I, I can't tell you how many times I was laughed at. I can't tell you how many times I was mocked. I, I think I've shared with you the story of the first sergeant who called me Jesus. He would come in and he said, where's Jesus? I'm looking for Jesus. Oh, the first time I heard him say that, man, I just got... Ugh. Who knows what I'm talking about? My skin crawled. But then I began to realize I might be the only Jesus this guy ever gets to see. So I want to be that guy. So I didn't rebuke him for calling me Jesus. I just kept telling him about Jesus. And guess what? The more he hated me for it. I can't tell you how many times that I would be in a meeting or I would be at a in a formation. And somebody would say something really silly or just crazy. Trying to get me to say something or do something. Really they were trying to see if they could get me to be angry. And you know something? They achieved it most of the time. Can I get an amen? Say, Pastor, we're praying for you. But I'm glad that I had the Holy Spirit in me. Somebody shout amen. Because the Holy Spirit took that anger and shoved it around, and turned it into grace and mercy. And allowed me to speak then in a way where people could understand the glory of God. When I transferred from the army into working for the state of Washington, again, I found myself mocked and made fun of, tormented many times. I can remember being in a meeting. Listen, I can remember being in a meeting one time. I was not, I was not 
well, I wasn't pastoring a senior pastoring a church. I was associate pastor at another church. But I remember being in a meeting, and it was full of doctors, psychiatrists mostly, but doctors. There were a few medical doctors, but mostly psychiatrists. And they had, this, they had these records, and they're talking about these kids. These are kids, and they would, they'd be doing a meeting. They'd be, they had their file open. They'd be talking about their progress and how things were going. And I'm not sure how I was in this meeting, but I happened to be in this meeting. And there's probably 10 or 15 staff around. And they pull open this, this chart, and they start talking about this young man. And one of the counselors goes, Well, he recently found Jesus Christ as his Savior, so he's acting differently now. And suddenly, all 15 heads turned and looked where? Right at me. I kid you not. And of course, the comment was, well, what do you think about this, Mr. Kylo? And here's was my, this was my comment. I said, if he has sincerely accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, if he's been transformed by the blood of the Lamb, if the Holy Spirit is residing in him, you'll have no more trouble out of that young man. No more trouble. They all quickly turned their heads the other direction and started writing in their pads. Because they didn't want to hear what? The truth. The simple truth. That young man got discharged from the prison. And as far as I know, he's, being, he's a, success, a successful young man today. Can somebody shout amen? amen. More of an example of what God can do than anything else. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have been given the ability to tell the world just how wonderful He is. What He's accomplished in my life. To show the world just how real He is. As we grow closer and closer to the Lord, the world will witness our love, our honor, and our desire to please the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And for some, it will make all the difference. Who here would love to see one of your co-workers come to the knowledge of Jesus? Who here would love to see one of your students come to the knowledge of Jesus? How many here would love to see a family member come to the knowledge of Jesus? You say, Pastor, they make fun of me. They laugh at me every time I see them. You keep loving them and telling them about Jesus. And pray that the Holy Spirit will break through their lives. As we talk, it will include our relationship with Jesus. Listen, through the power of the Holy Ghost, we are to live a righteousness which will help us to show the world the glory of God. When the world is burning down buildings, we stand up and declare the glory of God. So I shout Amen. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, our presence in the world should bring conviction that will cause people to reflect on their own lost condition. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will remain committed to our Savior in such a way that it will show our love of God, not only to God, but to them. I want the world to know Jesus because I live a life that is giving glory to Jesus. Is anyone here de devoted to God? Anyone here committed to the, to the power of the Holy Spirit in your lives? Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will walk in holiness. And my friends, the only thing that I know that can change the world today is the holiness of God. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will have an intense desire to please Christ in whatever way we can. That is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. If the worship team would come back, please. Wow. I know that's a, that's a lot to take in. In this world where we are hated, the road will often be rough. There will often be times. I, I heard God speaking this to me again this morning. There will be times when the world will seem foggy. Even your walk in the world will seem foggy. There will be times when it seems like there's chaos all around us. And it will be hard to know which way to go. I am so glad. That God the Holy Spirit knows who I am. This morning, I don't, you probably don't get up as early as I do on Sunday mornings, but 
I got up early this morning and was watching uh, David Jeremiah preach. And towards the end of his sermon, he said this. He said, in the days that we live right now, I find that I do not know what to do most of the time. But my eyes are on Jesus. My eyes are on Jesus. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Do you know this morning that if his eye is on the sparrow, his eye is on you? How many of you in this building know that Jesus loves you today? Please raise a hand real high. If you know that Jesus loves you, raise a hand real high. In John chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, real quickly. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up another way is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will never follow a stranger, but will run from him. For they, do not, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Let's worship him just for a moment if we might. <laughs>